This week on the show, the fascinating story of my guest, Leanne Thomas, who grew up Mennonite, uh, had some time uh, in Pentecostal circles, and then encountered the Anglican Church and found herself on the way to ordination as an Anglican priest. But along the way, began asking questions about the early church. Was there really an, an apostasy that that forced the Reformation to, to, to happen? What does she believe about baptism? The, the practice of adult baptism, of, of Anabaptists uh, from her childhood versus infant baptism, the, the beauty of, of the liturgy. And the more she encountered and, and asked Catholic questions, questions about unity of the church, of the Anglican church that she was a part of, and the larger Christian church, and how it was possible to, to have unity at all if there's much disagreement over, over the Bible and biblical texts and, and ideas and these kinds of things without the Pope. It's a fascinating story of, of one person, uh, Leanne, genuinely honestly, earnestly seeking God, and then trusting God with her life, with her vocation, in a sense, the, the way that she thought things might go, trusting God with that when she realizes that she's being called into the Catholic Church. It's an awesome, fascinating, and very unique story that I'm happy to bring you guys this week on the show. And I'm grateful to Leanne and her husband, Matthew, for sharing their stories and this story, this opportunity with us. Please watch and enjoy. Hey friends, welcome back to the show. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. If you're listening on podcast, thank you. Make sure you follow the, the show on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, or wherever you find it. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify, though, please leave a rating or review. That helps to push the podcast out to new listeners and expands the reach of, of stories like this one we're about to hear today. If you are watching on YouTube, thank you for watching. Please make sure you subscribe to our channel, uh, like the video, hit the bell to get notified of new videos as they come out each and every week, and please do interact with us in the comments. That's a great place to leave your, your ideas and have some awesome, rich discussions uh, and some crazy ones too. But thanks guys for your, for your comments. Uh, this is going to be a fantastic conversation this week. Uh, a unique one, an interesting one, one that I've been looking forward to for a, a long time and hopefully you guys enjoy it as much as I'm about to enjoy this. I am sure I am joined by Leanne Thomas. She holds an MA in Old Testament from Regent College, is the co-author <clears throat> I'll do it over again. I'm sorry. I had a little frog in my throat. I am joined by Leanne Thomas. She has an MA in Old Testament from Regent College, is the co-author with her husband, Matthew, of the commentaries on 1st and 2nd Maccabees in the Ignatius Study Bible. That's awesome. She was previously an ordinant for the priesthood with the Anglican Church in Canada before being received to the Catholic Church in 2013. And she and her husband live in California with their four children, Camille, Raphael, Michael, and Agnes. Leanne, I am super excited to have you on the show. Uh, welcome. Thanks for being here. And hello. <laughs> hello. Thank you for having me, too. Oh, absolutely. You know, I, I met your, your husband, uh, Dr. Matthew Thomas, through some mutual friends a few years ago. And I, I had him on the show. He told a bit of his story and a bit of his research around uh, works of the law and stuff on St. Paul and really cool, groundbreaking stuff. And afterwards, we were chatting, and he talked a little bit about, about you guys and, and your story. And I realized as he was talking that I think I got the, the, the less interesting uh, Thomas uh, when I talked to Matthew. And I think, Leanne, I think you're the more interesting one of that couple. So sorry, sorry, Matthew, if, if you're watching and, and listening. I'm sure he is, because he, who wouldn't want, want to watch your story, Leanne? Uh, but this is, this is the real deal, I think, the, the much more interesting uh, Thomas uh, spouse. So, so thanks for being here. This is going to be a really cool conversation because you have a really interesting story. So, yeah, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm happy to be here. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I want to, uh, what I want to do for this episode is kind of kind of get out of the way and let you un unfold your story. Uh, we can start as far back as you want to go and, and go forward from there. Uh, we can stop and dig in along the way to interesting things. I know there's some cool twists and turns in your story. Uh, I have heard from a few people, because we have some mutual friends in common, about you guys and your story. Uh, so kind of cool to hear from you now. Uh, but yeah, I mean, go back where you want to go back and, and start kind of unfurling your, your faith journey. Where does it begin for you? Where did your faith story start? And we'll go from there, Leanne. Where do you want to begin? 
Yeah, I guess it could begin maybe just where I grew up in. Um, so I grew up uh, in Northern Alberta, which in just like this tiny little town, my husband loves to like show people on a map. <laughs> <laughs> he told he told one of his professors from Pepperdine where I grew up, and his professor didn't believe him. He was like, "No, there's nothing north of Edmonton." And, he was like, <laughs> and my wife is from somewhere like seven hours, eight hours drive north of Edmonton. So, um, but yeah, it's a little Mennonite community, and um, yeah, so that's kind of how I grew up. Uh, in a, like a conservative Mennonite community, um, part of more of an evangelical Mennonite church. So there was like heavy emphasis on, you know, saying a prayer to Jesus to accept the Lord into your heart and, or accept Jesus into your heart when you're little. And um, yeah, I think, so that was, I guess, kind of my beginning because there was no infant baptism. So, um, yeah, I I think I was just scared <laughs> at night when I would go to bed. We would always pray this prayer. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep if I should die before I wake. <laughs> I pray the Lord my soul to take, which is apparently also in Enter Sandman. Um, Metallica, <laughs> which is the, my husband's only reference for that prayer. But um, yeah, so I think just praying that prayer every night, it would just like make me dream of skulls and death. And I was just scared. And so my mom said, like, oh, well, if you pray and ask Jesus into your heart, then you don't have to be scared of dying. So I was like, okay, I guess that's what I'll do. And um, yeah, I think it took a little bit longer. Obviously that was when I was seven or eight for it to really sink in. And I mean, as, but being, part of a, a community of faith, like everyone in my town were Christians. Um, it just, yeah, everybody is expected you go to church every Sunday. There was Sunday school for everybody every Sunday. So you just, I'm just go to church and learn, learn all the Bible stories. Um, and yeah, it was, it was a neat, a neat place. I think it's, <laughs> A lot different than California now. <laughs> um, but yeah, and then as a teenager, I ended up having a really neat uh, lady who was about 10 years older um, than I was and my friends. And she came in and she taught us our Sunday school class. And she was just really good at mentoring. And so, and, and being really honest, she's a very like sarcastic person and honest and so it was, it was neat to see kind of what the faith looks like as someone who's older can choose this for themselves it's not their parents bringing them or anything she she encouraged us to memorize scripture and um, encourage us to go on a missions trip and stuff like that so doing i think doing those things just slowly like helped my faith grow more and more yeah, was so the community sounds really interesting, almost like a very uh, a, a microcosm of of a larger world. Everybody having such strong Christian faith in there. So obviously that set for you uh, a, a strong foundation, and then meeting this meeting this uh, awesome mentor lady again as a teenager. Again, that kind of that, uh, that re reaffirms that kind of foundation. Was it? Mm -hmm. Did you did you know or or encounter? any Catholics in that sphere whatsoever in, in that early lifetime? In, in... Yeah, I did actually. I think, cause so my town was Mennonite and the, all the kids almost exclusively grew up speaking German, except for me, cause my dad was English. So when we moved there, I was seven or eight and my, I didn't have any friends cause I was new to the town and none of the kids spoke. English very well, but there was this one other girl who I think had moved there pretty recently as well. Her dad was involved with the school. I think he was like one of the superintendents for the school division, and she was a Catholic girl, probably the only other Catholic, or the only Catholic family yeah, in yeah. our town. And she became my best friend. So I, 
spend a lot of time at her house and she would burn incense and I'd be like, what is that? <laughs> but, um, I think I went to church once with her too. And it was like, Oh no, you stay in this pew while we go up for communion. Um, but yeah, they were, they were a faithful Catholic family. And so she was, you know, she was neat. it was neat to experience that. I think from a young age, because I think as I got older, it was like, Oh yeah, Catholics are, yeah. You know, Christmas and Easter Christians yeah. or someone else described yeah. them as like submarine Christians. They like reappear for <laughs> Christmas and Easter, but mostly they're submerged. So, <laughs> but yeah, I, was, I, I knew from the time I was, she was my best friend from the time I was seven to 12. And they were there. I think they had nine kids. So, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that sounds that sounds right. That sounds right. Yeah, th there wasn't there wasn't like an overt kind of anti-Catholicism though in the, the the tenor of the that the the Mennonite brand that that was kind of uh, that you grew up in though. There wasn't then uh, kind of an overt opposition to, to Catholic things. Yeah, there definitely was. Okay, I, there's a, just a few things that I remember. So, the, when I was preparing for baptism at seventeen. Their, my, the, the person that they brought in to come kind of teach us about uh, baptism was a former Catholic okay. who had been in dialogue and a very faithful Catholic who had been in dialogue with um, my Mennonite kind of church leaders. Um, and he had ended up becoming cat or becoming Mennonite over justification so I think that's the oh, first yeah. time I ever heard someone like talk about theology. And I was just like, hmm, interesting. So yeah, he was persuaded that Luther's view of justification was correct over the Catholic view and had yeah. become Mennonite. And so I was like, okay. And then I, this one other comment, I think my best friend's mom made about mother Teresa, who was like, Oh, she did all those good things, but you know, she didn't have like that assurance of salvation, I think, because her biography had come out that, you know, that she had experienced that feeling of like a dark night yeah. of the soul kind of from God. So I was like, hmm. <laughs> but yeah, there was definitely some anti-Catholic sentiments there that I became aware of, I think, more as I grew up. Interesting. And, yeah. It, my, so my, best friend in her family they would join our like my parents small group bible study but never became mennonite and it was, it was like well why wouldn't you you know and i think for them did they just yeah, knew their faith and that you know, tradition wasn't wasn't correct on a few things but they were happy to engage with it and have be part of that community because yeah there were no other Catholics around really to, to have a sense of community with. So. Yeah. Interesting. So where did you go next? You're, you're this teenager who's met this awesome mentor. You're digging deeper into your, your faith. Where, where do you, where do you go from there? Yeah. Um, so yeah, at that time too, I ended up, I think it was my final year of high school. I was diagnosed with, um, a lymphoma. So I had to go through from about December, or January through July, I went through chemo treatment. And I really like looking back, that was tough. But now looking at it, like I just appreciate that time so much because it helped, I think, fortify my faith before leaving to go to college. And um, also gave me like a really strong experience of that community because they like they were all like praying for me all the time everybody everywhere I go they'd be like we're praying for you yeah. like, our kids are praying for you <laughs> um they like set up this big fundraiser a lady from my church came and she would like read scripture to me she read the gospel of mark to me while I lay there because I didn't have a lot of energy and so it was a really neat time of like yeah just really feeling the community yeah, yeah. of Christ or the body of Christ minister to me also just coming to grips with kind of my own, own mortality and just like how much at the end of the day we have God and that's it. So yeah, that, 
that happened and then I kind of went into remission and went off to college right away. And I had no idea what I wanted to do, but I was like, I think at some point my mom was a nurse. My, um, yeah, just, and she, yeah, I can't remember why exactly when I went into nursing. I just thought, oh, this is, <laughs> this will probably be a good fit for me. Yeah. You know, I wanted, I, I want to like share God's love with people, but probably more in a practical way. So just yeah, serving yeah. people. And um, I think I did that for a little while and I was like, no, this isn't it. And then during that time I had come across, and I think leaving my, my Mennonite bubble and, and going to, um, going to the big city of Edmonton, Alberta, <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I was trying to find a Christian community and stuff. And I had, I come across um, just in my summer, like an apostle groups. And it, it just, I think coming, coming into contact with different lines of thinking on theological things. It just, and then also, yeah, just growing up, I think, and leaving made me, have a lot of questions about what I believe exactly. Like, I know I want to follow God, but what does that exactly look like and mean? And then, yeah, the whole, like, it was a, it was a lot of charismatic stuff happening. Um, so I knew I didn't want to be a nurse. So I withdrew from my nursing studies and was like, well, what do I do next? I have all these, like, questions I think it would probably be good for me to just take some time and look into those and just take some time with God I think I went from going through like cancer and that whole experience and then just jumping into like a really intense nursing program it was probably probably good to just take a break and do something less intense for a while so I ended up going to a Bible college at that point in British Columbia. And yeah, it was it was a new Bible college. I went there because it was Pentecostal, or it was supposed to be. <laughs> but the theology professor there had recently become Anglican from being Pentecostal. And so I, yeah, I think that's where I, I kind of got exposed to some some Anglican or like more tr- church tradition I guess and, and, you know all like history courses and theology courses and scripture courses it was I really liked it I was only supposed to go for a year and then I ended up being there for three years and just <laughs> at the end be like I just want to do this more I want to learn more so yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, I'm curious, you step outside this Mennonite bubble, as you described it, into the, mm-hmm. a larger world of other Christian denominations and Christian groups maybe you hadn't been exposed to as much before. You land yeah. in, a, in a Pentecostal group, it sounds like, charismatic, which is near and dear to my heart. That's where I was for quite a while in some charismatic circles. Was that shocking to you, strange to you? Obviously, you, you loved it and then began to dig deeper into theology after encountering a group like this, but was it was it was it eye opening? It must have been to see other Christian forms of, of worship. Yeah, it was definitely more expressive than what I grew up with. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, I think yeah, just it engaging so much more of the spirit. I think, in which I hadn't. I don't think I had thought of before the role of the Holy Spirit. And so, you know, just praying more and relying on the Holy Spirit for help and just the possibility of like healings, especially I think having gone through something yeah, yeah. like cancer, just the, and then like the process of chemotherapy. I think the idea of being like that God could actually just heal you without using those things. It was like really attractive for me, really scary for my mom. Cause she was like, <laughs> you know, uh, no, you need to, you need, it, 
if something were to happen to you, I, I just don't want you to just pray, pray, try to pray it away, you know, instead of seeking medical treatment and stuff. But yeah, I think just, there's, yeah, I can't remember exactly what all drew me to the Pentecostal, um, the, the more charismatic movements. It didn't last for very long. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It was a very short time. I think I got a bit exhausted from it. Yeah. But yeah. then definitely as I was looking into more Catholic stuff, and the longer I've been in the Catholic world, I see more of that in Catholicism, and I, I can appreciate it, I think. You know, it's a kind of war on me. It, <laughs> it, the, the emotional like appeal all the time. So at the Bible college I was at, we had a chapel service every morning and it was like, okay, every morning we've got to like muster up yeah, this, yeah, yeah. this kind of energy and emotional state. And this would be your worship. And it was, yeah, <laughs> it got a bit exhausting. Yeah. And then that, that Anglican professor I had, he would sometimes come and lead the morning chapel service and he would just get up there and pray a collect, And I would love it. Interesting. <laughs> oh, wow this written out prayer yeah. like describes my experience and feelings and I don't have to muster up these, but it's like, yeah, I can pray through someone else's words. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, yeah, that, that definitely the Pentecostal. Um, yeah. I think I, it was maybe two, two years I spent in, Churches. Yeah. And it, yeah. Go ahead. You have a question. Yeah. Please. No, I, I, that's so fascinating. How scandalous for uh, to read a written prayer in a Pentecostal, you know, morning chapel service. That that seems to me like that. I guess maybe a bit more, uh, you know, in a Bible college context, perhaps things are are a bit more like you know you're you're digging the theology and you're experimenting with things and discussions and there's more dialogue. That that would to me seem totally scandalous to have a written prayer read in a Pentecostal like worship service. Like that's the exact opposite of anything we would have we would have thought as as tolerable in, in the circles that I ran with in in Pentecostal uh, 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 churches. Right, but I love that you, like, you, you. you what's the word? I'm, I want to say vibed. That's definitely the wrong word. You vibed with that. <laughs> you know that 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 was the vibe that you felt. You resonated with that. I, the that written prayer like that. Something in your spirit said like, yeah, this, this is what what feeds me. Not necessarily that emotional kind of high that mustering the emotions for the worship service, but that 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 written that written colic that written prayer. I, I think that's really interesting. That began to kind of work on your soul. Wow. Yeah. Well, I think so. The professor was four square, I think Pentecostal and he had been teaching there because of that. And then within the last year or two had become Anglican. And as, as he, he was the main theology professor. So he I think slowly started changing things to be more <laughs> Anglican as well. But it was a mix, a mix there. One of the other teachers was Baptist and most, mostly Pentecostal, but there was a yeah. few, few other yeah. strings there. So, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. And then I started going to his church and it was just more of that. Yeah. So it was, it went and, you know, it's not quite the mass, but there was a lot of the liturgy that's the same. And just going and sitting in a pew and having like set times where you like kneel or go up to the front. And it just, yeah, it felt really peaceful to just be able to sit there and pray with what was going on and yeah. to kind of get into a rhythm and not being like, okay, what's happening? And, I supposed to be standing now, raising my hands now. Um, yeah, and then I don't know. I guess the big Pentecostal mega churches—they just seem to carry more of like a, I don't know, kind of popularity or click kind of vibe. So it's just just not so interested in that at that point. Yeah. Like, and I think the more you study theology, the more 
you become like critical too of church services and preaching and most of the Pentecostal you know, the church I went to was just yeah more like sermon series yeah, and yeah, you know yeah. you pick a verse here or there and you kind of just talk to people about what you feel about that and tell some nice stories and I can I can see how people like that I just to think I, it stuck with me for very long so. Yeah, yeah, I wanted more. Yeah, yeah, and I have also. I I have very fond memories of my Pentecost time in the Pentecostal churches, but I always I always like to bring up the 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 ships series that we did once at a Pentecostal church. It was a worship, you know, a sermon series based on ships. So you know, worship, discipleship. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> What other 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 ships? But it was a, it was a ship series, and our pastor was a lovely guy. But he was a former bodybuilder who'd who'd went to Summit for a few years and come back with some kind of some kind of degree, and was now leading this church. Uh, and and I, I think, like you say, I mean, there was a, there was emotion, there was uh, intense love for the Bible, for Scripture. There was incredible service outreach in this church that I was. It was a, a university town amazing outreach to the students on, on campuses there. It was amazing. But like you say, you began to kind of study theology, study like the, I mean, the history of the church, these kind of things. And you feel like you're, you're maybe wanting a bit more sometimes in some of those contexts when you realize that it, it's, it's, well, they're, they're, it's, it's kind of pick and choose sermon series, right? You end up with ship series because you're kind of you pick a theme and then find find parts of the Bible to, to, to preach on that, that meet this theme, right? Whereas perhaps in the Anglican Church, at least, certainly in the Catholic Church, you're following readings that are prescribed for you by the church, by 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 an ancient kind of formula or older formula that that you're then having to present and and teach on these verses rather than kind of your own uh, whims or <coughs> excuse me, your own whims or ideas, right? So I think that's yeah, definitely. I you know. I, I'm just saying. I, I yeah. I, I get that when you say, when you say that you kind of long for a bit more there, maybe. Yeah, and I think too in our, my conversations with some of the the other uh, people at the church, where I would like share what I was learning about, or um, just my excitement for learning theology and even like church history or um, any of that. Uh, yeah, there would be like kind of pushback and like, no, we really don't need to study that much because the Holy Spirit will just lead our yes, reading and yes. guide. And like, why would I need to do that when I have the Holy Spirit? And it would be like, yeah, I can kind of see where you're coming from. But also like, I also have this experience where I think the Holy Spirit is telling me something and then... I, or, you know, I think I know what this means in scripture. And then I read something from yeah. like a theological textbook or even just look at all the different ways other people have read these scripture passages. And for me, one of the first ones I went to was infant baptism because I grew up in a Baptist and then I had a theology professor who would become Anglican and was, yes, yes. you know, very pro infant baptism now. And so I was looking up stuff on infant baptism and um, just like coming across so much that was enlightening. Like, Oh, I wouldn't have come to this on my own, even if I was probably praying and asking the Holy spirit to yeah. guide me, you know? So just having that, those other voices be able to like inform my reading, I found really helpful. Yeah, yeah that's, that's fantastic. And there are sometimes, at least there was for me, not really an, an, an anti intellectualism per se, but the idea that you don't need other things like that. You don't have to read theology books mm -hmm. or, 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 or commentaries. You can sit down with your, it, you know, it, it's kind of that, that trope sometimes that, that Catholic apologists will, will, uh, will maybe try and try and straw man and attack when they're talking about sola scriptura, uh, you know, Bible alone Christianity. It's mm -hmm. the worst caricature. But in many cases, it, it, and I found it could be quite true in a Bible study. It really is me and, you know, 10 other guys and girls with our Bibles reading something and for ourselves working it out. Uh, you know, there, there wasn't ever the need to bring in commentaries or, or other ideas. I can remember the first time I brought an early church father's commentary to a Bible study and everyone kind of went, what's, 
Why do you, what's that? Like, what, you, don't, you, don't, you don't need that. What do you, like, who, who are these guys? What do they know? Right? So it, it is sometimes that caricature, but then it does really happen sometimes in, in even juggle circles, where it really is me and my Bible kind of working things out. And heaven forbid we encounter something that is contrary to what our church teaches, then suddenly we're like, well, okay, this becomes, this becomes a problem. How do we res- wrestle through this? If we see this verse and our understanding doesn't quite match what we've been told, we have to understand that like. So it's fast, that's interesting that, that you kind of encounter a bit of that, uh, that too, I think. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Was, yeah, I don't know if I would describe them as anti-intellectual. I mean, yeah. they had other pursuits and stuff, yeah, I think, yeah. just for their faith. You know, they would they were educated in other things. But as, when it came to their faith, the Holy Spirit was kind of enough. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, yeah, I probably would have felt the same for a good while, except that I was being forced to read other things <laughs> and, um, and, and encountering other positions that made me reconsider yeah. and think like, oh, maybe there's more here that I haven't looked at before. And what do I really think about this? So, yeah. So, so you encounter an, an Anglican professor, you began attending this Anglican church you you're doing your time here at bible college what happens next in your story where do you where do you go from there yeah well i think like so at bible college i there was so yeah he he had us read certain things like we read lumen gentium and i really liked it (laughs) and i think i was reading that at the same time i was taking a pauline class that and i was just like reading the epistles and hearing over and over again from Paul, like, you know, be united, be one. I'm just like, okay, so it's really important to Paul that we are one. So there must be some really good reason that we're not, that we've, you know, separated. And I had taken church history courses, but some of it was less, you know, I, I, I think less, details especially like you know so the the eastern church splitting off was i think reduced down to some dispute on I can't remember, sausages or i can't remember what it was <laughs> so i didn't it took me a while i think to really understand some more of the the details around the reformation but um i knew you know why my mennonite group broke off because of the, bapti- the issue of baptism. But I are, had looked at that and come on the side of the you know, Anabaptist, or not the Anabaptist, the, the, the baptism. So, okay, so it's, that was one. And then kind of trying to look at other reasons why, you know, why would we be not united as a, as a, as a Christian body, the faithful. And, yeah, I think that that question from then on was just in the kind of the back of my mind. What are our reasons for disunity, yeah, and yeah. are are they valid? Like, do is this a real? Is this does this actually merit being separated? And I think the more I went on, it's like just more of those reasons I'm just get, getting knocked down. So, yeah. So infant baptism at first, and then I think stuff on the Pope and Mary were kind of up next. And because I think my my uh, Anglican teacher or professor, he, I think they're those were the only two areas he really disagreed with the church. And even with Mary, so like um, Mary he taught us like about Mary being like the Theotokos. So you know, there's high honor given to Mary. And even in just doing that, I think my, yeah. my stance towards her changed so much. It's not like, why do we even pay attention to the Virgin Mary, you know, to being like, Oh yeah, she really did do something quite amazing. <laughs> yeah. um, she is pretty important. Uh, and then, 
yeah, with the Pope and stuff, those were questions of authority. And it took me, I think, a long time, mostly my husband, I think, because that was his, that was, I think, for him, the big, the big, um, yeah, the big kind of question that he had that he was always coming back to, kind of like by whose authority, what authority, you know, so he would, we would talk through these things a lot. And so I would, I would hear his questions a lot. But I mean, yeah, I don't have a good answer for that either. <laughs> so you, you do your time at this Bible college. Did you, did you graduate there, go on somewhere else next? Uh, what happened after that? Yeah. So I graduated there. Um, and I think, I was really wanting to go into ministry of some kind and thinking, okay, maybe I have this like, yeah, interest in theology. And in, this is like kind of what I am most passionate about at this point. So I probably want to pursue this more and maybe, maybe work towards uh, like Anglican, like ordination and be an Anglican priest. Um, and so I graduated and wanted to go keep studying. And I had had a few teachers from Regent College come and teach. And they were, they were just phenomenal teachers. And so I was like, I want to go where they, <laughs> where they went because they obviously had, yeah, they, they learned a lot there and were able to be amazing teachers. So... I applied there and in the meantime went and worked road construction. Drove <laughs> as, like as, a as packer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I did that. I'm trying to think. I had done that a little bit during during my summers from Bible college too. But that was the first year I think I got to be an operator. And then <laughs> It's a very boring job. So I had a lot of time to listen through stuff too and read and just read different. I think I read like Paul the Spirit and the People of God, the Gordon B one. Um uh yeah, just some great, great books, but uh and applied to Regent College and started started there. Um thinking I probably want to go do some Anglican, be it become an Anglican priest. Yeah. Yeah, I love I love the boring job listening to listening to through reading books. I had a similar job in a warehouse uh, my summers during university, and uh, that's where I first encountered podcasting back in the day when it was you're plugging in your giant iPod with a cable into a computer and turning it on in the morning, having and downloading things onto it was you know a very cumbersome activity back in like I think 2005 maybe or, or even before that. But that's where, I, that's where I first encountered actually my very first Catholic, who was a podcasting Catholic priest. So I listened to hours of his podcast, then realized he was Catholic and went, wait a second, Catholics <laughs> can, can be cool and interesting and have, have good theology. <laughs> it was kind of a, 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 an eye-opening experience for me. So I love that you, you and your boring job have to also had time to, to read and listen through things at the same time. That's great. I love that. Yeah, I, I should probably mention too that while I was at Bible college, I had gone, I'd been taking a course on like how to grow healthy churches. And um, I was going to go to this really cool emergent church in Seattle. And somehow that fell through. And so the only um, kind of realistic thing to do was just to go to the Catholic church. Because <laughs> I had, you had to go to like, three different churches of a different oh, tradition okay. yeah, than you yeah. either grew up with or were currently going to. So we had gone to an Eastern Orthodox one or Eastern, I, I think so, but they were an English Eastern Orthodox church. And then, um, so I was like, oh, I guess we'll go to the Catholic church. And I went on Palm Sunday and it was amazing. Yeah. Was like, so many of my preconceptions of, of Catholicism, you know, they don't really read their Bibles. They, it's just all authoritarian. The priest does everything. Um, yeah, they're basically empty churches as nobody goes. 
um, we're all just kind of gone because it was amazing. It was <laughs> so many people. And then on Palm Sunday, you have the like the congregation doing a lot of the meeting yeah. too. And so just seeing that dynamic, whoa, it's, it's, it's really cool. <laughs> so I think my, I was like, oh, at that point, I think Catholicism, I like learned about it and been when I was younger. But I, I think at that point, I was like, hmm, this seems like a little bit more plausible, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I can't be a priest here, so I probably won't, you know, yeah. or I can't, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I don't know what this would look like, but I liked what I saw there a lot, so, <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's, that's interesting. Okay, that's really interesting. But you didn't convert on the spot. It wasn't like a lightning bolt <laughs> conversion moment for you. It was, <laughs> it was. Yeah. So what, what was next then? Because you're, you're on this, you're in this path, you're, you're, you're studying deeper now, I guess, right? At, at Regent with your eye on potentially uh, the Anglican priesthood. That's, that's interesting. What, what happened next? Yeah, I think, yeah, I was studying. It was just a lot of studying. And so I took some courses. Um, I don't remember. It was like history of, Christian doctrine with Hans Borsma that got us reading a lot more. Um, I think we read like on Christian doctrine by Augustine and just like, Oh, these sound really Catholic, (laughs) (laughs) like all this stuff or even the the Didache. It's just, Oh, okay. So, you know, that fall paradigm where like, you know, it all like the early church was really great. And then sometime after it fell into like this more like tradition of men and then, you know, the Reformation recovered it, whatever it was. was Mm -hmm. Maybe this is not quite (laughs) how it went. So there, there was a lot of things I was just thinking about, but for a, a long time, I think, I probably would have just been happy to um, kind of take what I was learning and bring it into whatever context I found myself in as a, as a Protestant, as an Anglican. And I think it probably took going to going through a um, internship at my Anglican church where I had to preach and get up there and actually, um, say what I thought about something or another. I was like, huh, this is Anglican church. I think I, I had to really think about what it was to be Anglican because it just kind of seemed like you could, like the church is described as broad, right? Like you could hold almost anything as yeah, an Anglican yeah. and it's plausible. You just have to give your, you know, good argument for it. And that's, you know, and, and be convincing and you can be Anglican and you can do this and that too. And I think, yeah, going, going up there and preaching and having to really think about what I believed on one or another topic, it was hard. It was hard to do. Hard to, I think I wanted more of the tradition and more of a guiding voice yeah. and it not to come down to me. Yeah. I think that's so fascinating. I've heard of something very similar from actually a charismatic Pentecostal pastor I had in the show a while ago who said a similar thing that for him, a real moment of, of clarity, uh, I guess clarity and confusion and concern was when he realized that what he was saying up there on the pulpit was really his opinion formed from reading that he had done, but really presented as, well, here's what we believe as a church. And that was in the microcosm of, of his church, his denomination. But here you are in the Anglican church, a much larger kind of denomination, which much, much, much deeper roots, but a similar experience of, I think, r- realizing as you have to begin to actually defend what you believe, right, and, and preach from a place of authority, like, you know, on that pulpit, that you begin to encounter the fact that, well, wait a second, why do we believe this exactly? And how can we 
hold this here in Anglicanism, but also hold this here when they're so far, far apart, it, it, but still part of the same kind of framework. Is that that's basically what it, what am I right in saying that? <laughs> I think so. Yeah, it kind of felt like rather than come to a decision on what is right we're just going to say both things and right. then whoever thinks one thing is right can follow that and whoever thinks the other thing is right i think like on the eucharist when you the eucharistic prayer or i can't remember exactly or maybe it's when they give you the eucharist they're they're saying just basically it has both views of the eucharist in it <laughs> um uh yeah and yeah, I, I think it, over that time too, I just came to value more, I guess, just how how much I didn't know. <laughs> it felt like the authority would be passed to me to know kind of everything as as one of, of as a pastor. And I wasn't part of the Anglican Church of Canada. It was the kind of breakaway group, Anglican Network in Canada, um, that kind of falls under ACNA, or the Anglican yeah. Church yeah. in North America. Yeah. It's a little more conservative, but I think they still wanted, some within there still wanted, you know, women priests, and um, even if they are more yeah, reluctant on other kinds of change. So. <laughs> yeah, that's that's so fascinating. So you you, it sounds like you were pretty set on exploring this idea of of ordination to Anglican priesthood, but you began to feel some doubts when you, I guess, were forced to preach and defend your views in the kind of a broad context. Even I guess even in a more conservative Anglican tradition, which is interesting, there's still enough enough broadness. I guess is that a word? Broadness? I don't know. It is now. <laughs> It, it, even in you know in the conservative tradition, there's still enough of that of that leeway that 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 movement that you're having to kind of defend your view you know a, as you preach it. So so what happened next? Did you did you decide no not for me on the spot or was this a thing that kind of grew and developed? Like how far along did you get before you began to ask more Catholic questions? Yeah, I think it's a good question. Yeah, I, I think because I had Matt beside me asking all these questions all the time too, especially on authority and stuff, and I kind of like brush them off. And I get it, but I don't really want to talk about it right now. I don't want Catholicism to be true. Um, but I, yeah, I think there was a few, few just moments where it was just like, okay, I. And, and just studying and just um, yeah, coming across more of the tradition that I didn't hold to at that time. And um, like, what's a good example, like the um, perpetual virginity of Mary, you know, I wouldn't have thought that was a thing, <laughs> but that it's something you find in like, the earliest kind of church fathers and like, oh interesting okay and um just the more the more I learned the more I just realized how wrong I was on so many things uh, I, I think it just put me in a eventually put me in a disposition to just be like okay I just want to know you know I just want to learn I don't need to be the arbiter of what is true and not like i think the church throughout history is better than, that than i am in my little yeah, yeah. you know small kind of realm of experience and so yeah the more things like that i just that i think i just kind of stopped trying to really yeah, argue for my position and just wanted to like learn. And then as I was learning, I was like, wow, the Catholic Church is saying some really like good things. And even I can't remember, I think for 
my church history, one of my church history classes there, we had to read some of the Council of Trent. And I really liked it. <laughs> like this, this, they've got some good points here. I wouldn't have thought that they, you know, had so many good points. This is really well thought out. And they're not just, you know, trying to stamp out rebellion. Like they're actually presenting rational arguments for why they've done what they, or why they do what they do as Catholics, why they practice what they practice. And yeah, and I think eventually it just came down to just like, you know, that one thing, like me wanting to be a priest or, you know, even just like my future, what I was going, the direction I was heading at, as an Anglican priest was like, this was the only kind of barrier. I, I kind of knew that was, was it like I kind of come to so many, the Catholic side on so many things that I think I had kind of crossed that threshold of just being like, I just basically, I think I believe whatever the Catholic church teaches to be true at this point. Um, so one, some, one of my summers working road construction, I just, prayed the rosary, I think, every day, and then went to mass every Sunday, because there was no Anglican churches around anyway that were really, kind of, I didn't, I'm sure there was, but I don't think they were very well attended, or, you know, I don't think in every community either, because I was in rural Alberta. Yeah, yeah. So I'd go into the Catholic churches and just go to mass and just... I think some of the some of the things that I was maybe a little more worried about, like you know they don't ordain women, um, so then like women must have kind of the same place within the Catholic Church that I've seen in some other Protestant circles where you know, they're just not given positions of leadership at all, yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's you know only men. And it just kind of seems a little more, yeah, just like yelp male kind of rules everything. And then you have women in submission. I just, I didn't see that in the Catholic church. And I don't, I saw a bunch of women like seem to carry themselves with a lot of dignity and respect. And I was like, huh, this is really interesting. This isn't what I thought, like I would have thought. You know, the women here would be very submissive and quiet and kind of put the heads down, but they seem to be, they seem to know their worth here. This is, <laughs> this is really something to consider. And yeah, I think um, praying the rosary probably every day helped a lot too. Just thinking about Mary's role in, hmm, yeah, maybe. Maybe she has something to do with it. This honor given to Mary, you know? <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think it just eventually came down to, I think when I got back from that summer and I talked to uh, my rector, he, I was saying, you know, I've been going to mass <laughs> over the summer and praying the rosary. And I just... I think I believe what the Catholic Church teaches on almost everything. And he just said, well, that's okay. You can believe everything the Catholic <laughs> Church teaches, yeah. you know, as long as, you know, you know, you don't you know, kind of hold that the Pope is, has that <laughs> special role yeah. or, you know, you know, some of stuff about Mary too. You probably want to keep that down a little bit. And I was like, yeah, I just, I think the Pope is really important. <laughs> and I think his role is kind of crucial in order for keeping church unity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and he was like, hmm, yeah, maybe don't tell anybody that. <laughs> so <laughs> I was like, okay, so this might be a problem. Yeah. <laughs> and then we started, I started going through RCIA that fall along with still working and interning at my Anglican church. <laughs> or no, wait, maybe I stopped then. Maybe that was when I actually stopped. I can't remember the exact timeline, but 
Yeah, I think I think I was still interning for a little bit, maybe like a few months before I stopped. But yeah. <laughs> I think that's so interesting because you mentioned before the this notion of Christian unity kind of digging at you, right? And of course, there's there's some kind of unity in the Anglican Church because there's a there's a global communion of Anglicans. Now these days, is fracturing more and more and more as it was it certainly beginning yeah. to in your time because you weren't even part of the actually Anglican Church in Canada. You were on a, a part of a kind of break off shoot in a sense, right? So there was the fracturing yeah. even then, but certainly it would have been a more maybe a more of a, a move towards a unified Christianity, but you then begin to recognize that without the Pope, there can't be that unity, right? That, 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 that was, I guess, probably pretty deeply felt for you. And of course, not compatible <laughs> with being an Anglican priest, right? <laughs> yeah, because I think how Anglican had, or how my Anglican kind of priest mentor had talked to me about Anglicanism was that it's like the left lung of the church. Yeah. So we're basically in communion with Rome. We can believe almost everything, but you know, the there's more of a like an equality among the bishops instead of one, like the bishop of Rome. We see, he's still a bishop, but it, we like more democracy, I guess, instead of like, hierarchical among the bishops. And yeah, I can I say I can see. Can see that kind of except it just I don't know if it works because <laughs> you can see I think yeah just even how within the Anglican Church it doesn't seem like the authority really to make decisions is there you know they their way of making decisions is just to allow for all positions and yeah. to just exist as long as we just still in name at least say we're in communion. Yeah. But we can hold to kind of whatever we want individually or parish to parish. And it's just what kind of union is that? Or what kind of unity is that? You know, when you can't really hold much in common anymore as like as regards to like the faith. <laughs> so I think that's that things like that, like okay, this is that's something I should probably think more seriously about joining. Yeah. Do I really, do I really want to lead in this context? Or yeah. yeah, yeah. And I love your insight too into seeing women in the Catholic Church, you know, in roles and carrying themselves with, with dignity and the, the importance of Mary and beginning to, to see these things in contrast. I think of, you know, for, for my wife and I, this was a conversation that we had too coming into the Catholic Church. We're, we're both converts as well. And one of the things in discussion with different friends of ours that struck us really interestingly is we were part of for a long time, you know, Baptist churches or Pentecostal churches, which would have had women on staff in leadership roles called you know, the women's, you know, uh, ministry leader or something, right? Never the pastor, right? Never called children's ministry pastor or, you know, or, or youth pastor or, or children's pastor or, or, you know, or whatever it might be, even, even not even called women's pastor, right? If a woman was in a leadership role, she, she couldn't be called pastor or and have any men under her in a role of authority. And it was a very kind of haphazard, we couldn't discern, even asking questions of, of those in leadership and the denomination, why that was the case exactly, right? It was kind of, there were some verses that backed that up, but it wasn't really super thought out kind of church to church to, to church. It was more of an ad hoc kind of idea. And as we wrestled with Catholicism and what the Catholic Church believed, we actually found much more clarity and sensibility and, and theological depth in the Catholic Church's view on women in leadership and in order, you know, in ordained roles, it made a lot more sense, right? You can you can not agree with it, perhaps, but but spelled out, it was a lot more coherent and and logical and ancient and based on on good theology than a lot of the more ad hoc positions that some of these uh, evangelical churches kind of kind of held, even if they seemed to allow women in more leadership roles, they couldn't explain why those women could only do certain roles and have certain titles. It was a kind of a weird juxtaposition for us, right? But we saw then, in contrast, 
the, the depth and clarity and, and, and grounding and, and why the church, the Catholic Church said, well, here are, here are the limits. It made a lot more sense, I think. Yeah, for sure. I think, so that's one I, when I became Catholic, I just didn't fully understand, I think. Uh, my disposition at that point was like, I just trust the church. I yeah, figure yeah, like yeah. if I have every, I, I can't really, you know, have every question I have of the church answered before becoming Catholic, because it will just take me so yeah, long yeah. to become Catholic, I think. But I, at that point, I think I just trusted the church. I was like, I'll figure it out in time or I'll, you know, the reasons will, you know, make themselves known in time. And so, but yeah, that was one, I think, especially where we were studying at Regent, there was a lot of reformed folks there. I think probably because of Packer, it attracted a lot of, a lot of reformed um, men <laughs> and, it was, you know, and Mark Driscoll, I think, was big at the time. And just that sense of, like, I just don't really see, like, you I don't really see a good argument for why women can't be pastors in these contexts. Like, it really comes down to arguments on, like, they're just not as good at doing this leadership thing as a man. And it's like, but I know many brilliant women who do yeah. great who are great leaders. And I think one of the teachers at Regent, she was like a great example of it. I don't think she was for women's ordination or herself, but you know, if you're looking at like the skill set that you would need to be a, a good pastor, I think a lot of women fit that really well. And so it's like, it seems a bit just kind of unfair and, yeah. I don't know what you're saying about women that they can't do these kinds of things. And the the arguments on that side were great. <laughs> so when, but when I came into like the Catholic church, it was like the reasons given were, you know, because Jesus himself was a man, you know, and he is, you know, the apostles themselves are men. And the, these, this is the succession of the apostles. And I, I think the thing that really resonated with me over time was just thinking about the incarnation and the fact that sure. that's a real thing, you know? So for Catholics, like Christ really came in the flesh, which means he came as a man. And so if someone is acting in his person as a priest is, then it makes sense that he also be a man. So... I don't, I, that argument probably only goes so far. It, you know, it's not a Jewish man or, you know, but that one kind of seemed to, to make the most sense to me is that this person is acting in the person of Christ and then, um, and him being a man just kind of reinforces the reality of the incarnation being an actual historical thing. Yeah. 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 That's a hard thing to, to give up though, to come into the Catholic church, uh, you know, is this thing you've kind of pursued for a long time, the ordination, uh, what was it, was it easier to give up as you began to see fault lines in, in you know, in, in the Anglican theology and, and, the, and the church and began to, you know, have to preach and work those things out and then pray the rosary and, and kind of come around to all these Catholic ideas and then realize that you kind of believe the Pope probably is a, is a good thing and kind of be told, well, you can't, you can't believe that, that. I mean, it seems to me like a very hard thing to give up to, to become Catholic. You know, one can say it's almost like, you know, I don't know if you felt it as a vocation for you, but that's a pretty serious thing to have to give up to, to convert. Yeah, I think it was hard. It took, I think that's probably what took me the longest. And I didn't, it, it didn't take that long for me. My husband took longer. <laughs> so I always laugh. I was like, you always kind of joke that I became Catholic first, you know. <laughs> he might have had the better argument, but uh, I became Catholic first. So. Beat him uh, to the Catholic Church. Um, but yeah, I think it, it was, it took me a while to be ready for it, I think, to be ready to be like, okay, my future. 
I don't know what I'm going to do now. <laughs> you know, I don't, but it's, yeah, I think that's why I'm really grateful also for my experiences, like, um, as like a teenager going through cancer because realizing that, you know, at the end of the day, all I have is God in my relationship with him. So any like plans or things that I've made for myself always have to be, I think, ready to submit to him. So yeah, and I think I'm one just one evening, just that that hit me. It was just like, okay, if if this is, you know, if this is true. And um yeah, I'm convinced of it and then I shouldn't I shouldn't let kind of my practical concerns about or my like ideas of what I think I should be doing with my life from here on out yeah. dictate where I go. I'm a bit more of an idealist, I guess. It's like <laughs> I should I, there's like a kind of you know, a call to just trust and just see yeah. what happens. Because at the end of the day I can always become a nun or, you know, if, you know, at that time, Matt and I were just still dating. So it was like, you know, either we get married and I just see where this goes, you know, or I become a nun. <laughs> so, yeah. Just... Yeah. I love that there's a backup plan. <laughs> this is like, <laughs> worst case scenario. I can become a nun. I, I love that. You make it sound so easy just being docile to the, the will of God and, and trusting and following that. But it's a very hard, hard thing to do. I think where I wonder, you know, I often on this show, we have the opposite. We have, we have uh, men, you know, pastors who are men with, with their wives or their spouses becoming Catholic and leaving the spouse to figure it out afterwards kind of thing. Like men just charge in and, and convert. And then, oh yeah. What, what do you, what do you think, dear? Uh, so, so your interesting case to ask you what, you know, you said you're, you and you and Matt were dating at the time. What did, I mean, what did Matt think? Because here he was maybe planning to to be married to an Anglican priest down the road and probably looking looking at that in you know somewhere over the over the hill in, in you know in the journey ahead. What that's an interesting thing to suddenly go, oh wait, I'm becoming Catholic actually instead. <laughs> yeah, well I think he knew that he was heading that way too. He maybe wasn't like quite ready to yeah, yeah. to yeah fully give up trying to find some sort of solution to the authority problem within the <laughs> protestant church or like you know I, he's really inspired by c.s lewis too so the fact that lewis remained anglican and was able to like bring so much of the tradition yeah. um to his fellow anglicans and even to like yeah other Protestant groups, it's like, well, if you become Catholic, you kind of lose that ability to bridge the two worlds. And so, yeah, he he was definitely more open, I think. But I don't know, I don't know what he thought of me. I think he was he was happy. <laughs> I don't know. He's not the biggest planner. <laughs> <laughs> as far as he likes he likes to just wing it so he was like whatever well, if you want to do that sure that's great <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's amazing. That's incredible. Okay, I want to ask you a couple more questions, um, if you have a few more minutes. And I, I think the first one is, like, so what since then? You, you became Catholic. Uh, it was, it was I mean, not a huge change. Obviously, it's a, kind of a gradual change for you. Uh, different than maybe you would have pictured your future to be at, at an earlier point. But what, what are the things that you've then come to really appreciate and love since becoming Catholic that maybe you didn't have figured out? Kind of right away. Is there other things that stick out to you? Like, yeah, that I, that I love. These, these things I, I get. Hmm. Good question. I think like the liturgical seasons of just like feasting and fasting and yeah, yeah. Um, yeah those have been really cool. Uh, going through Lent and. Mm. Yeah, um, that too. And then mm, I think it's 
probably my, I, I would have described myself as a feminist before. Obviously, I'm going to try to become an Anglican priest. <laughs> so, um, and then I think the longer I'm in the Catholic Church, I just, I know there's some Catholic women who are consider themselves feminists too. So, um, yeah, but they wouldn't have the same experience as me. But I found that, you know, just following following church teaching on like um, like natural family planning and stuff. It's like all of that and just becoming a mother. Um, I. I've appreciated a lot more. I think so the, the wisdom of the church, yeah, the Catholic yeah. church in that. And also found like some of the, some of the people most appreciative for what I do as a mother are like Catholic priests. <laughs> so, and I wouldn't have expected that. I would have thought, oh, they don't really care that much about mothers. They're all about, <laughs> you know, being important priests and, um, but they're, yeah, especially the really conservative priests, they're often the ones that will spend the most time with mothers oh, yeah. <laughs> trying to like, you know, help give us whatever kinds of catechesis or resources we need to, to help raise our kids. So I think that, yeah, made me question a lot of feminism. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's amazing, and especially since since the, in the Anglican world, things like natural family planning, like like you know, like contraception, like the rich teaching the Catholic Church has around marriage and and sex and sexuality, those those things in the Anglican Church is the church that first began to erode those things. I think it, it, for Protestantism, right? They they first changed their view on contraception, and then other groups began to kind of follow suit. So it's fascinating that, and I and, and we also, you know, my wife and I resonate with with these kind of things, and like you say the the more you embrace those new roles you know motherhood fatherhood begin to have a family and, and think about those things you realize the wisdom of the catholic church as opposed to secular values which are largely values that many parts of protestant christianity certainly many parts of the anglican church would have would have embraced and continue to embrace uh you know in that broad spectrum of, of anglican churches right because there's quite liberal parts of that church as well, but yeah, I love that, right? You you begin to see the wisdom in the Catholic Church and those things as you begin to experience those milestones in life, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, there is. Yeah, <laughs> I just don't know. There's just so many things. I'm like, oh, I feel like I can actually ask some questions about, you know, the feminist movement and and stuff like that. But I don't know if I would have been able to explore yeah. <laughs> in a more secular environment like you know what the just the biological reality of being a woman and what yeah. that means when you have kids you know <laughs> like, oh yeah it's just all of a sudden these more traditional roles just become just as it seemed to make more sense and i know it doesn't work that way for everybody um but it has in our situation. I'm just like, oh, I don't, I don't know why I would fight against this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's lovely. That's lovely. Okay, one more question for you, if if, if you can spare the time. Uh, and that's, I guess... I, I have lots of, of guests on this show, like yourself, lots of listeners to, to this show, and with lots of lots of emails, correspondence that I get, people that I've actually met literally on the on the street in some cases, who are who are in the thick of the Anglican Church and and struggling, right, hitting against questions that, that you hit against, right, questions of well, how can I defend my view in this kind of broad broad context of so many other views that kind of accept all these views as as equally okay how can that how can that create unity right questions like like how do we decide things right like more and more these days uh, i have i have i have listeners and friends in the anglican church who are experiencing the church voting on things and changing changing ancient traditional doctrines based on kind of majority votes right versus reading the bible or or voting voting with what we've done for the last 2,000 years. And, and there's major shifts happening in parts of the church. Even some of the conservative, uh, you know, theologically conservative 
kind of offshoots or, or break-offs of the Anglican Church are experiencing, you know, overtures towards more liberal theology and kind of changing things, uh, moving away from that, that tradition. So I'm wondering, like, those, those Anglicans that are in that church that are, that are wrestling, that are not sure if they can remain in that church and be in the United Church that, that, that makes, makes sense anymore. I mean, you, you felt those things. Is the answer, well, just convert? <laughs> are, there, is, is, uh, are there steps you'd recommend? Like, are, there, is, are there questions that you'd, you'd prompt those people to begin asking to kind of work at their soul? Like, what, do you, what, what would you say to a person like that who's wondering what to do? where to go yeah um it's a good question yeah i think you know one of the most helpful things for us was just or for my husband and then for myself was just going to mass and getting to know real catholics right you know yeah. and because i think part of the difficulty in becoming catholic at least for me was just not from the time, you know, my best friend and I, like she moved away and we weren't friends, so I didn't have any close Catholics that I knew. And I think that was probably, yeah, getting to know, coming, going to mass more and just seeing Catholicism lived out yeah, helped yeah, yeah. ease a lot of my fears about it. It's like, you know, it's, you know there is a living faith here and, um, and um, yeah, I, I think going to mass and then just yeah, keep keep pursuing the truth because at the end of the day, you know, you have God to answer to. You know, I think <laughs> there's a lot of. It seems like you know, for the people that we know that maybe yeah, the practical concerns of, of becoming Catholic can can certainly be the issues um, yeah I don't know I, I definitely don't regret it <laughs> I think you know <laughs> right after becoming Catholic like the next day I was like oh no what did I do <laughs> what have I done I think my, it felt like my identity had changed somehow um, and but after that point um, it definitely it's it's been like, I think I told Matt once, like, I think being Catholic is the thing I like most about myself. <laughs> so <laughs> there's just, yeah, there's just a real peace, I think, in having the, the tradition and following the tradition and having like unbroken, I think, tradition too. So it's not like as a Protestant, it can feel like you're, picking and kind of choosing what you want to keep from the tradition. Um, whereas with Catholicism, it's, it's, it's continuous. Like you're always, you've got the same tradition. So um, there's like, there's a, I think a piece just in, in um, knowing you're surrounded by the communion of the saints. I don't know what else, how else you describe it really, but they're the, yeah, and to me, I think that's just like what the tradition is too. It's like the states throughout history that have worked out a lot of the theological problems um, at, um, through just sort of different controversies that came up in their ages. And so it's not all on us to figure everything out. Yeah. You know, yeah. That we also have the body of Christ to, to lean on. <laughs> I, I don't know what advice exactly. Besides, yeah, get to know no, some yeah. some faithful Catholics and see see what what it actually looks like in practice. Yeah, yeah, no, that's good. That's very that that's very good advice. I think I love that, and also an expression that I have tried myself for years and years to articulate. That many guests in this show have tried to articulate that that you've brought up. That 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 states that that piece. That piece of being part of, you know, being a, a pebble in the stream of tradition, right? That's flowing all around you. That's always flown that way. It's beautiful. It's peaceful. It's it's restful. Versus wrestling out everything you believe in and not not knowing for sure if you got the right you know interpretation 
of your Bible or that denomination or that thing. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a peaceful feeling. Yeah, I think, I think you said that very well, Liam. <laughs> yeah, and I think like there can be a fear that like it takes the individual out. Like, you know, then you, what are you, you don't have like really any any part to play you just kind of are this passive receptor of tradition and i definitely haven't felt that at all you know you have like core doctrines and stuff but there's just so much to learn and so much to like put yourself i guess just at the the feet of tradition and that yeah I haven't really felt like, I guess, in some ways, a passive receptor. Again, there's just a lot to, to just learn. And it's fun to be, be in that position, <laughs> not having to be be the one that figures it all out. You know. I love that. That's, that's fantastic. Uh, Leanne, it's been a real pleasure talking to you. I appreciate taking the time out, uh, making Matt watch all the kids while you, we enjoy a little chit <laughs> chat. That's been great. So hopefully he's, he's being made to work for his, uh, for his time. Uh, I, I, <laughs> that's awesome. Um, normally I ask, you know, I'd ask guests to tell me where they can go to, to or where listeners can go to, to read, you know, your, your blog or your, your podcast or your <laughs> video series. You have a, a fantastic commentary written along uh, with your husband, Matt, for, uh, yeah. on first and second Maccabees. Uh, that, that's, that's lovely. Uh, so I'll definitely put that in the link for the show notes. Anywhere else do you want me to point them towards for things that you think would be valuable for them to, to find or, or to follow? No. <laughs> no, not Matt. Not any of Matt it. stuff. It's not. No, oh yeah, nothing. yeah. No, I'm kidding. No. I mean, <laughs> he doesn't. He doesn't need any more. Any more people are reading this stuff. It's not that good anyway. <laughs> yeah, his stuff is great. I love his yeah. stuff. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. One so yeah, guy. yeah. Read my husband's stuff. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> we both love him. Love him very much. So we're we're, yeah. we're just kidding around, Matt. And I'm sorry. Uh, well, Lee, and I want to say thank you for taking your time out here and, and doing this. Uh, listeners will love this conversation, I'm sure. And I really appreciate uh, you you doing this. I've been looking forward to talking to you for a long time since I first met your husband and talked to him and realized that you were the more interesting one. So thank you. I was right. You are more interesting than he is. That, that's lovely. I don't know about that. <laughs> well, I think so. I want to say God bless you, uh, the work you've done and are doing for the church. And thank you so much for being here uh, today, Leanne. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you.